Hello everybody and welcome back. I'm Ro Runner, and today I'm making Dungeons and Dragons political. That's right folks, I'm going to be talking about the newest long adventure campaign released by Wizards of the Coast, Tomb of Annihilation, and why it is, in fact, based on racist ideologies. But first off, I'm going to preface this video by saying this is my first video in podcast form, so I do apologise in advance if you're seeing any strange graphics on the screen, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching this from wherever you get your podcasts, excellent, I'm glad it's made it to you. Um, hello! And of course, do let me know what you think of this new format and whether you think it works for my style of content. Another quick disclaimer. This video will explicitly mention racism within the tabletop gaming industry. This doesn't mean that I'm calling anyone a racist, as I don't think that makes for a productive conversation. What I am doing is saying that the creators of Dungeons and Dragons harbour and or spread views that conform to racist ideologies of whiteness being superior to all other ethnicities and races. Also, I'm white. This means that I harbour and spread racist views from time to time without me lowering it. Of course, I'm trying to unlearn these things by raising the voices of people of colour wherever I can within our industry to educate us all. So in this video, a lot of the ideas are not original to myself, but instead came from a number of different POC. And when I say that, I mean people of colour, authors, and I will be linking all their work down in the comments below. Um, so you'll be able to see them and really go and give them the love that they deserve. Sorry for all that blurb, but I hope it has intrigued you enough to keep you here to see what I have to say about racism in Tomb of Annihilation. Tomb of Annihilation promised to be a fantastic reboot of the various modules in D&D's history that reference the peninsula of Cholt, home to a prosperous black society and treacherous jungles, dinosaurs and undead. When I first saw this book, I was completely hooked on the idea, bought it as soon as I could, or rather got someone to give it to me as a gift because uh, I am a massive cheapskate. I flipped through the pages and was happy, if not a bit suspicious, uh, to see all the black characters on almost every page with a culture that I did not recognise minus the capitalism, of course. There are so many cool maps and art in this book and I really, really enjoyed it for months. I'm a geographer, I love a great map. I loved the detail that was given in this huge player map, uh, as well as all the different dungeon master tips and tricks that you were given throughout the book, including the extra materials in the form of maps because I'm a map nerd. Um, and it was really excellent for a new DM to pick it up and play and get really excited about it. And that's why I did get excited about it. I actually started to prepare a campaign for this. Um, and when I did so, I read it a lot more closely. And one of the things that I found was that there really wasn't that much to go on if you are creating a proper campaign setting. It was excellent if you wanted to kind of create an adventure and didn't want to think about it too much. But if you really wanted to create a campaign where uh, the whole adventure, the whole story would sit within one peninsula of Cholt, this wasn't a great book. As I'm white and all of my friends bar one I'd play with were white, I wanted to make sure I wasn't just perpetuating racist ideologies because something about it just didn't feel right. Uh, and I didn't want to enjoy Tomb of Annihilation the way it was written if it was racist. Um, turns out it was when I started reading about it. So when I looked it up online, I first came across Cecilia D'Anastasio's article that describes Wizard of the Coast's depiction of black culture as lazy. So I kind of read a little bit more around this and realised, yeah, sounds about right. Essentially, she claims the setting to be a huge mixture of snippets of traditional tribal culture cherry-picked from across the African continent to create a stereotypical picture of Africa. And I put that in quotes, not that you can see it here. It's hot. The language doesn't sound anywhere close to a European one and everyone wears skins. Thank you very much, Wizards, for that. Breaking the barriers, baking the boundaries of what's known knowledge. Real, real imaginative there. The creation of Cholt can be traced back to the first edition when a little corner of the Forgotten Realms map was marked with a tagline consisting of tall, ebony-skinned traders. Again, I'm quoting here no detailed history came with it, unlike the other whitewashed areas of the continent. For AD&D, an adventure module based on the novel entitled Ring of Winter detailed the Tabaxi tribe and a single city, Mesro, but again, there was nowhere near enough support for an entire campaign setting, only just enough for one-shots themselves. 
Fourth edition really took the area to some dark depths in terms of racism, to be honest. Enter racist undertones of describing the black civilization there as noble savages, again in quotes, without agency to non-black colonizers who came out of conflicts unscathed, obviously, because that's what colonizers do. They survive. The colonized people do not. And those people are generally people of color. Fifth edition sees a lot more history fleshed out and changed for Cholt. And you can really see that the writers have tried to add more character to the place. They've added new cities, new stories, and they've really tried to expand on something that really wasn't dealt with very well and was basically a blank slate for them. However, all you have to do is look at the amount of time dedicated to Batiri goblin culture compared to, oh, I don't know, the human race that has lived there for centuries, Choltons, to see that they really didn't put as much effort in as they should have. Honestly, there's a whole half side of A4 dedicated to Batiri goblins, whereas I think it's a quarter to an eighth of a page is dedicated to Choltons. That is absolutely ridiculous. Thanks, by the way, to G.A. Barber for all the info here. Again, I've linked his article down in the comments below. Barber, or POC Gamer, continues with this paragraph that I'm just going to have to read out because it's such a good description of how colonialism is really played out in this adventure. Now, I'm not saying that fantasy worlds can't have colonialism, but what I'm saying is it mimics almost you know, exactly what has happened in our lifetimes, or pff, not in our lifetimes, in our history, that we really shouldn't be trying to repeat based on race, which is what colonialism that's happened in the past is based on. So here it goes. For what was added in TOA, Toltons have been further reduced to caricatures of Africans based on colonial perceptions. They never deployed trade or trade abilities and had to learn it from the Amnion and Tethrian profiteers and merchants. They aren't permitted to have a long history. Their history starts, for all intentions, with when whites arrived in Cholt. There is no drive to find Mesro, reclaim lost lands, defeat the undead, re-establish kingdoms, find out why Uptau abandoned the place, or do anything else that would indicate independence from the white-driven economic powers that dominate the political and economic situation in Cholt. Sure, Cholton merchants took over Port Nianzaru, but in reality, the loss meant nothing to Am, because the port is still utterly dependent on them and their trade to survive. So we already have apparent dependency on white people, but I just want to highlight this a little bit more. Let's talk about the four different cities on the peninsula, although there are more in many different aspects. You've got Omu, Umbala, and Orolunga, as well as, of course, Port Nianzaru. Now, the first three are lost cities. They've all been in conflict at some point, but that doesn't mean that their legacy can't live on. There's about two sentences in the book which says that the kings and queens of yesteryear came together to survive in Port Nainzaru. But they didn't say how. They didn't say if there were factions involved. They didn't say if there were struggles. It just said, we now have one city and not many political complexities to work with here. I think that is poor, poor execution. The political situation would surely not have just concentrated on the affairs of Port Nizaru. It must be a mess of political factions vying for power still. Maybe not in the more literal sense of I'm going to send an army to you, but most likely in a way of underhand uh, power grabbing to really get the control of Port Nizaru back, the bastion of hope, so to speak. It also seems like that the politics itself in Port Nianzaru is really, really oversimplified. Now, when I first came to the book, I saw seven merchant princes and thought, oh, that's actually quite a unique idea that I hadn't seen before. But when I read a little bit more around it, it appears to be just like how African kings and queens have had to uh, become traders in the face of Western colonialism. They had to do away with their past traditions to really uh, focus on the economic gains to really have any say in this world. Um, and that's what's happened as well for the Choltons in Port Nainzaru. So there's big mimic, mimerics, mimerics, mirrorings <laughs> with um, everyday life. This really doesn't bode well for attracting people of colour to the hobby. If 
you're making a scene that is oversimplified for majority white audiences who aren't aware of the large variety of African cultures, then you're not going to really encourage people of colour and the people who are aware of African cultures to get involved with the hobby if you're oversimplifying and painting it with a very, very broad brush. Again, another quote from Cecilia D'Anastasio. Here's the rub. While many people I talk to enjoy how the history and political structures of Cholt were expanded in Tomb of Annihilation and enjoyed the adventure's plot generally, they were still unimpressed by its execution. Its setting is an amalgamation of African cultures, a trope frequent in 20th century media that flattens the dimensionality of human experiences on the continent, which contains hundreds of ethnic groups. There are nods to West African voodoo, South African clicked-based Khoisan languages, East African attire, like Kenyan kofia hats, and the jungle climate of Central Africa. Its fantasy setting dissolves Africa, in quotes, into an all-in-one cultural stew that comes off as a little detached. So essentially, what Tomb of Annihilation and therefore the culture of Chult does is mix a variety of different cultures together. And now I'm not saying that it is a bad thing for a fantasy world, something that's make-belief, to mix uh, different inspirations from the real world together to create your own world. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that all of these different examples that's been used here has been stereotyped to the extent that they have become negative tropes against these various cultures, and it's nothing new. It has been used, it has been tokenized, it has been laughed at, and it is not uh, progressive in any way to use these forms of uh, stereotypicalization of uh, African cultures. And as I said, African cultures, there's more than one, we should not be painting it into one culture. Other black people throughout the article spoke of the inaccuracy in a lot of the language used that was meant to relate to, and I say this in quotes, African cultures. Apparently the words and names are from three language groups that span the continent that has 2,000 languages in it. You can't paint 2,000 languages with one brush to an amalgam of three language groups. That is not how language works, and that is not how you appropriately represent a society that you are very obviously trying to represent. Let's also talk about mad monkey fever for a second. Mad monkey fever is a disease that you get from a mysterious mist that passes through the jungle. Now, I'm not against mysterious mists. I think they're very interesting plot devices for an RPG campaign. However, I am concerned about calling it mad monkey fever. Associating monkeys with black people is a very typical racist trope. Now, why, how have I drawn this link? That is not what this mad monkey fever is about at all. But if we think about this a different way, Cholt is associated with a majority black civilization. If we talk about a fever that you can get from exploring this peninsula, again, exploring this black civilization or an extension of it called mad monkey. This is associating black people with being mad monkeys, with being animals, with being less than human and with being less than intelligent, less intelligent than uh, their white apparent superiors. So all in all, this is an incredibly racist assumption and it really does not do the book any favours. I listened to a really good podcast a while ago from Yo, Is This Racist? which explicitly went into how that comparison made people of colour feel, which I will again link down below. In short, it makes them feel not very good at all. So just briefly bouncing off of that, I want to talk about how Cholt is othered by Tomb of Annihilation. The players are expected to arrive there by teleporting, creating emotional distance from other parts of their world by having no way to venture there on land, which is where a significant amount of any campaign is based. In a player's mind, Cholt is a floating entity disconnected from the rest of the world that can only be reached by teleportation. We've also got very few plot hooks that suggest players are from Cholt itself. Three of the 15, that's right, 15 character hooks, a fifth of the character cooks leave the door open for someone to originate in Cholt, and then only one hook itself, the Outlander hook, suggests that you are native there. Easily a criminal or an entertainer could be based in Port Nazari, but no, you have been sent on an expedition to Cholt instead. This doesn't exactly encourage local people to be involved in the campaign. You are very much 
su- suggested to be an outside party coming to save the day somehow. This obviously sounds very much like colonialism, but I'm not going to link it explicitly there just because a lot of, you know, adventuring in many different games is meant to save the day. So that's a little bit far to uh, expand upon, to extrapolate to. But when I say local people, as I did earlier, I, of course, equate that with people of colour in real life. It doesn't really encourage people of colour to get involved in this campaign because if they don't see themselves in a uh, party going on an expedition to a foreign land where black people are the majority race, then it doesn't really bode well for encouraging them to get involved in the story. Actually, a little note on my wording that I've used throughout this video now. I've seen around that some people have said that when I use or when other people use people of colour, they should really be saying people of colour with a culturally African background because you know, someone like a British person of colour is less likely to be aware of the intricacies of, say, African cultures. While this is true, this is not the point I'm trying to make. I'm saying that assumptions about culture is very, very strongly tied to assumptions about race, and in a colonial context like this one, it is all rooted in white supremacy. Just have a look at other D&D modules that are meant to centre Arabic or Indian cultures, for example, and you'll find very, very similar problems. But I'm not going to be going into all of that now because otherwise this podcast will last forever. While perhaps people of colour who are unaware of African cultures may feel less affected by the evident colonialism imbued through Tomb of Annihilation, that does not mean that they will feel any less cheated by the associations that can be drawn between skin colour and inferiority. Anyway, back to othering. Chult is very disconnected from the rest of the Gotham Realms politically. Sure, there are Order of the Gauntlet camps, references to the Lord's Alliance, Zentarin, and even a fort for the Flaming Fist, but these are all outposts with their own separate missions. They don't in any way link to wider politics of the continent, making them forgotten and left to lead a life still hampered by previous conflicts that have destroyed their cities and kingdoms. The external organisations don't care about Chult, so the players aren't expected to either. Now, I can already anticipate a number of arguments against what I've been saying. This is YouTube, after all. Mainly that Wizards of the Coast tried, that they tried their best, and we should recognise their efforts. Yes, there has been clearly a lot of effort into Tumen Alienation, and I don't want to underscore that, but that's not what this review is about. There are many other reviews that say uh, how good Tumen Annihilation is, what they're concerned about in terms of the mechanics there. I look really like the look of the gameplay and the story opportunities but that doesn't mean i encourage you to pick it up and i will explain that as i go through the rest of this podcast yes some history has been added to cholt through tomb of annihilation but D&D has been going for more than 40 years and we shouldn't be expecting them to just try to include more people of colour and non-Western cultures. They can do more than just try. They should put more effort into it than just repeating tropes and they should most certainly actually consult with the people they are trying to emulate and cater for. Yeah, that's right, folks. They didn't even have a person of colour on the design team at all. I mean, come on, that's basic stuff. If you want to include them in your output, you've got to include them in your input too. Even I know that, and I'm only 21 and not even finished uni yet. D&D are big budget, and it's not as if there aren't any POC RPG designers out there, so they honestly have no excuse. Another thing I can expect people to say is, why should I care? I'm white and my black friend thinks it's fine or whatever and the gameplay is great so why should I stop myself from enjoying a great product for me? Well first of all, if you're as passionate as I am about RPGs, you'll want as many people as possible enjoying this great hobby. Encouraging and supporting material that supports racist ideologies means that we're limiting who it can reach. Giving your money to this product allows the company to continue without much self-criticism. If a project tanks, for example, because people don't support what it's saying, it gives the company a chance to take a second look at what it did wrong and hopefully learn something. Secondly, having these conversations means that we'll slowly but surely improve over time. I honestly believe that we will slowly and surely improve. 
Understanding people's experiences of games will only make better games in the future. Thanks so much to all the fabulous commentators out there who I was able to leech off to make this video. Go and give them a supportive comment on their content, letting them know that you really want to change the way D&D works. Don't talk about me, talk about them. You want to support them as much as possible. Now, a couple of things from me. Firstly, what do you think of this new podcast style? It's much easier for me to make, I am not going to lie, and it gives me an excellent excuse to ramble. I have been going for over 20 minutes now and it feels fantastic. So it's obviously easier videos for me means the possibility of more uploads. So let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. What do you think about all of that? Secondly, have you tried Tomb of Annihilation or are you going to? Now, I hope this video has given you the obvious answer to the second question, but I would very much be interested to hear your thoughts about all of this, especially if you're a person of colour. If you'd like to see more of these videos where I view games through a social justice lens, like this video and of course, subscribe. If you'd like me to review one of your tabletop RPG modules or PC games, please contact me via Twitter again. All the links will be down below. Thanks ever so much for watching and as usual, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.